think uh, coming up in May at uh, Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi Industry. So you can look for that to come. Also, the gas turbine group is going to be meeting on March 21st. It's not on Eventbrite yet, but it will be soon. Okay. Uh, what you see on the screen here. Uh, is our uh, ASME official DEI moment for diversity and inclusion. It's, uh, it's about how to be an ally. Um, and it, it reminds us that we should be listening to everyone and seeing that if we, can, if we can benefit from any of their experiences or points of view, we should be learning. Everyone should be learning and, learn and seeking the learning of others. And we should speak up anytime we uh, see or experience any inappropriate behavior so that everyone is included and at least has a, a chance to share their opinion. Um, let me look to see what we need to do here now so that we can find our presentation from the speaker. I think it's already, I think it's already, it's already there. All right, yeah. all right, very good. Then we'll, we, will, we will have him pull it up. Uh, let me uh, introduce our speaker. We are uh, thrilled to be at uh, RMS this evening. We've experienced a wonderful shop tour, and we have Stephen Collis, Collis here with us tonight. Um, uh, RMS also has a, a facility in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and uh, Stephen is uh, here with us. He has over 30 years of rotating machinery experience. Um, he has uh, worked at Drescher Rand, um, Penfield Industries, Conmec. Okay. Uh, he graduated from the New uh, Jersey Institute of Technology and also from Lehigh University with an MBA. So uh, we're thrilled to be here and we are um, looking forward to his presentation. And I will hand everything over to him now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm going to turn my back to you for a minute and see if we can't get this mm -hmm. presentation here on the screen. Mm -hmm. is, is this still open or do I need to reopen it? From? Hard to it's on the desktop. Oh, so just close that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is uh, firing up uh, a little bit more about my background. So I, I started. There we go. Um, I actually started my career at a college uh, with a mechanical engineering degree. I started as a compressor design engineer for Ingersoll Rand Turbo in Phillipsburg. Um, I left that business and was out of the rotating machinery business for 10 years, uh, but always with engineered equipment. And then in uh, 1994, I came uh, to work for a little company called Conmec, uh, which was formed when Dresser, Dresser Industries and Ingersoll Rand formed Dresser Rand. And the managers from Phillipsburg and the IR Turbo Division didn't want to move to Olio New York, so they started their own company. Um, so I was there for 12 years through private ownership and then being part of uh, Dover Diversified, which also owned AC Compressor at the time, of Trico Turbine Services. And then in 2001, that whole, first, that whole business was purchased by General Electric. I became a big part of GE oil and gas. I worked there for five years. The nice part about that was I got to spend a lot of time in Florence, Italy. Uh, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's an Italian company. Um, so in, in, in 06, a lot of us left there because, you know, being part of a small company and then working for a big company like GE, it's not a lot of fun. So we went and the restaurant opened up an office near us so we could all work there. So we went all all went to work for Dress Rand, and um, I worked there for 12 years. And when when that, we saw that was, it was announced that Siemens was going to buy that business, I had played lived that movie before, so I didn't want to do it again. So I've been with RMS now for five years, um, and so more than more than three quarters of my 40 plus year career has been involved in compressor, either design, applications, um, most, that's mostly what I've been doing, but I also have 
been involved in a lot of the other turbo machine hot gas expanders, steam turbines, and, and all the other equipment that we deal with. So th those are my bona fides. Let's see. This works. So uh, th this this uh, what's the name? Uh, the this is more than sure. So, okay. Uh, so we're back. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. If anyone asks a question, repeat it. Okay. Because we were yeah, on the yeah, last meeting. Be. Yes. We couldn't hear it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, I don't know if, you, if I turn you, is that Matt? Will all the lights go out? You can try. I think it's going to be everything. Yeah. 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 I'll do the car. Okay. Yeah. So just, just okay. Go there. That's better. I just wish I had Matt's voice because I, I have to tell when I do these presentations. I wasn't born with a voice that projects well. Yeah. So I kind of have to yell so the people in the back can hear me. And then what happens is after about an hour or so of this, I get you know, my voice starts getting worse. But anyway, what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to, to RMS. Um, I'm going to go through this really quick because you've seen a lot of it and talked about some of it. Uh, then we're going to get into the centrifugal compressor part. Uh, we're going to talk about performance, components of a centrifugal compressor, the design, performance improvements that have been through the years, and reliability improvement designs. And then we'll talk about some upgrades, which really are about reliability. And, and we'll go through a couple of examples of some interesting jobs that RMS has done in the past. So, all right. I gotta just figure out how to get this to advance. Yeah, it's not responsive. But I can see this. I can see this. I, yeah, but I, it's not coming up there. Try it. <laughs> so what is the connection of this? Thing? Because I don't know about this. And... Let me see if I can close this. Oh, maybe it's fighting with the other Oh, yeah. Maybe we can put it on the computer setting and see, like, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's, it's projecting here on the screen, but it's not going up to the television. Let's see if we can't get us back into the presentation mode. Okay. All right. Hey. All right. We're back. 
I missed the bathroom break, so sorry. <laughs> just sort of announced it. So this is this is just the Sparkle timeline of RMS itself. So in we talked already about the merger of Dresser Clark and the formation of Conmec, uh, but in in '88 when um, Conmec was acquired by Dover, a couple of the managers from Conmec left and started RMS. So that's that that's when that's when RMS. In uh, 2001, AC and Conmec uh, were purchased by GE, um, and then in 2007, RMS relocated to the current headquarters in, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, um, and, and that facility was purpose built for RMS and has since been added onto. So we've got uh, our first it was the office, then the office expanded, then the shop was built, and the shop was expanded, and, and we're landlocked in there now. Um, in 2001, the ACC operations in Wisconsin uh, were stopped. I mean, GE closed that down. And um, so they, they just transferred to, to a, a service business. Um, in 2015, RMS was sold to a private equity company, uh, Incline Equity Partners. And then in 2016, Incline was starting to invest money in the company. So they hired a bunch of engineers that were from, uh, with uh, AC Compressor. And then we opened an office in Appleton, Wisconsin for those guys who worked out. It was originally a group of, of five, five, uh, five of the, the engineers and designers from AC Compressor. Um, in 2017, we purchased this company here, that's this, this facility. Um, and, uh, and then in uh, 2018, we acquired the intellectual property for AC compressors and Conmec compression equipment from GE Oil and Gas. Uh, because a lot of us had experience with both those product lines and uh, we knew we could take that in and work it better and support it better than, than GE could. So I think that's proved that. In 2019, we were purchased by Cortec, which is a, a bigger private equity company than Incline. Um, and and they're, the, the, being owned by private equity is really very good because they put money into the company, they listen to what your needs are, where you can grow, and, it, and they help you do that. And even in, in the five years that I've been with RMS, it's, it's changed incredibly. So it's a much broader, stronger uh, operation. So this is our, what we call our multi-OEM. So we have two different groups, one that supports the AC compressor and one that supports all the other product lines, which is RMSs and all of our history. Just supporting turbo machinery in general, regardless of what the name of it is. Uh, so Tony Rubino is our ax axial compressor and he's also our chief engineer. Um, he has more than 35 years experience. Don Schaefer heads up, heads up our FCC hot gas expander group. And we support the majority, I think there's only a, a, a less than a handful of machines that are not RMS nameplates in FCC hot gas expander in the United States these days. Um, Sid Gross, 30 years of experience with steam and power turbines. Uh, he's, he's there. Uh, Doug Craig uh, works, uh, centrifugal compressor product leader. Uh, he has 35, 39 years of experience. Uh, myself, I've got 42 years of experience. And we have, we, have, uh, we also have George Don Donald, who's our guru. He was uh, the, the design manager, compressor design manager for Nusar Rand. He was one of the founders of Conmec. And he works with us a little bit more than half his time in supporting our design and engineering work. Uh, this is the AC compressor leadership. Uh, we got Ryan Rotier, who's the uh, centrifugal compressor leader, uh, 23 years of experience, mostly with the AC line, also with, was with GE. Russ Ertz is the oil free screw compressor with 26 years. Aladdin Weir, GE oil and gas AC compressor. Bill Egan, uh, who worked, I worked with for a while at Dresser Rand. Um, he, he worked with Howden, G Oil and Gas AC, and they, I guess they don't know anymore. <laughs> uh, Jeff, Jeff Lovelady has 41 years of experience. He's really a very, very good expert on, on oil free screws. And Mark Kerner, Kerner is the parts and field service, uh, 35 years of experience. Uh, 
in this. Uh, so engineering capabilities, we have, we can do, we have all the engineering capabilities that you find in any OEM around the world. Uh, we can do, uh, you know, by stress and vibration analysis, you see some expander blades up there, you see a, uh, a centrifugal compressor wheel. Uh, we can do compute, computerized fluid dynamics. Uh, you see some flow, uh, you know, colorful fluid dynamics. When you see these pretty charts with the flow going around an expander blade. Uh, there's a, a nodal that's called a safe diagram that shows you the vibration modes that are exist in the machine versus the excitation modes that exist in the machine. And you, if you know how to read that chart, you can tell if you're going to have a problem or something. Because there'll be an interference of the, the natural frequency with the excitation mode. And, and the, the bottom chart shows some of the rotor dynamic uh, capability. Um, that's just a simple support stiffness versus critical speed and where the actual bearings cross and where the speeds, the actual speeds of the machine cross. Uh, we'll go through and then we'll do a full forced uh, response analysis, torsional analysis. Uh, we can do uh, transient torsional analysis or to make sure that uh, you know, we're, we're staying, keeping the machine safe. This is a lot of the work we do in troubleshooting. Uh, this is our Bethlehem facility, which you didn't really see. <laughs> so our Bethlehem, our Bethlehem facility is a little bit smaller than this one. It's 30,000 square feet. We have, you know, pretty heavy thick crane uh, capacity, uh, big vertical boring mills, up to 40,000 pound rotor balancing, and full in-house MET capabilities. This is this is the facility you just saw. And uh, the, one of the other things we do is uh, turnkey uh, service. So we have a full on, on staff project managers and field service supervisors. Those are the people that are on, on the uh, RMS staff. I believe we're up to a group of like 14 or yeah. more field service uh, supervisors and managers. Um, we have affiliated with a lot of highly respected no right service organizations. So we can, we can pull from, from groups. We know which guys do good work and which ones we want to have on our team. Um, and, uh, January of this year, we did a complete, uh, we, we handled the entire turnaround for the FCC for Valero, Pembroke, and Wales. So we were the planners, we provided all the, the parts, all of the, all of the uh, supervision, all the tools, all of the mill rights, and, and managed the entire project from start to finish. Uh, so we can do, you know, detailed activity scheduling, and uh, we have the full capabilities there. Uh, so centrifugal compressor performance. So, you know, when we look at a compressor and somebody wants to do something to it, we go back to basics. You know, a centrifugal compressor is a machine, it's a volume flow machine that produces head. So it takes in a certain amount of volume on the inlet and it produces a certain amount of head as it goes through the machine. Um, this, is a, this is a performance curve for a centrifugal. As the flow goes down, the amount of head produced goes up, and as the flow goes up, the amount of the amount of head produced goes down. On the left, it's called the surge line. So that surge on the right is choke, and theoretically, the, the choke line goes at some point asymptotic down to zero. So it's where it's making pushing a lot of flow and no head. You don't want to operate there, but that's theoretically how what happens. Um, but so every machine does that. And centrifugals can be designed from about 800 ACFM up to about 300,000 ACFM in flow. But the compression results depend on the gas that you put through the machine. So to do a little thought experiment on that, I want to did a, I, I created a model where we have a stage that's rated at 10,000 ACFM and it produces 10,000 feet of head. We've assumed a couple of things that it's, it, the efficiency is 80% polytropic and it's, and it's at, at the rated point. And the initial condition of the gas is basically atmospheric pressure and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
nice round numbers to work with. So this is the results of putting different gases through that design point of that machine. So we start with a very low molecular weight gas of hydrogen, a little bit over two molecular weight. And then and when we run it through that design point. And you can see with hydrogen, the discharge pressure is 15.04. So it's about 0.3 pounds of pressurized with 10,000 feet of head. Pressure ratio is small. Discharge temperature just rises about you know, five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the mass flow in 10,000 ACFM is about 49.3 pounds per minute. So it's a small amount of pound, pounds in that amount of gas. And um, the discharge flow is not a whole lot different than the inlet flow on the next stage. It's only down by about 140 ACFM. Um, but then you can see as the molecular weight increases, so does the pressure ratio, so does the discharge temperature, so does the amount of mass flow in that gas for that same amount until you get all the way down to like propane, which is a pretty high molecular weight gas, there you're doing almost over, uh, almost 10 pounds of pressure rise. Um, and uh, the uh, discharge temperature is considerably higher, but the mass flow is over a thousand, almost 1100 pounds per minute in that 10,000 feet of gas, 10,000 CFM of gas. Um, one of the things I put up here was uh, air, because it's very similar to, to ethylene and molecular weight. And you can see it does a very similar pressure ratio, but where it differs a lot is in the, in the discharge temperature. And the reason for that is, is because the uh, ratio of the specific heats for air is 1.4 and ethylene is 1.23. I give this to customers a lot, and I put that up just to explain to them, like when we're looking at doing a performance on the machine, we really want to know what the gas analysis is. So for the same molecular weight gas, you can get pretty different results and you can have pretty different CFMs going into the next stage. So why is this, uh, why is this important to look at? Well, the point is, is that the output of the stage is different gas. Remember, we're building up a multi-stage machine. So after that goes through one stage of compression, you got another stage of compression that has its own particular design. And if you're building a multi-stage machine, that those gases ideally each stage has to match what the previous stage is putting out. So uh, with a, with a, a multi-stage machine requires a different one. So a low molecular weight, molecular weight gas may only have one to three different stage designs throughout the machine because you're not reducing the volume from stage to stage very much. You'll see in this uh, kind of ugly picture up here, that those tip widths are really not changing as you go back to the machine. Uh, with the higher molecular weight machines, um, the increased flow, you, the, uh, the, you know, the volume reduces a lot more from stage to stage. So you can see you got a pretty high flow 3D wheel here with a wide tip width. The second stage is smaller and the third stage is smaller yet because you're reducing the volume as the machine as it goes back to the machine. Uh, so it's important for this machine for at the design point for these stages to be matched. So they're all operating near their best efficiency point. So the machine operates at its best efficiency. Um, and it, the other thing is, is that again, when we're looking at maybe increasing the, the capacity of the machine, so you want to get more volume through it. With a, with a hydrogen machine, you're looking at replacing all the internals. Because it's all designed, all those, all are very close in design. If you want more volume, you got to change all of the internals. Where the machine that has a higher molecular weight gas, you can do some playing around. You can move the first and second stage back and put a bigger first stage on that makes the right pressure ratio to match the existing machine. So you got you got more flexibility and you can come up with a mix and match solution instead of problem. <clears throat> And there's only one more issue that you have to consider with different molecular weight gases, that it's gonna create a, a, single, a per, single stage is gonna have a different performance with a different molecular weight gas. So this is, this is the same stage. You got curves with low molecular weight gas and curves with a high molecular weight gas. You can see that they're not as efficient. The curves are, don't have as much range and they have much funnier shapes. They drop off much further. 
And this is all due to the effects of Mach numbers in the machine. Uh, high molecular weight has a higher, higher, uh, higher sonic velocity, so it's a higher Mach number in the machine. So you get a lot more degradation. <clears throat> so it may seem simple, but it's not. <laughs> So this is, you know, this would be what we consider a single stage compel, uh, compressor. This, 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 you can look at, and you can put any gas in there, and it's going to compress it just like you, just like you said, because it's designed to do a certain flow and a certain head, and it comes out and it collects it, and and it, you get what you get. So this will work perfectly fine because you're not trying to match match up the next stage with the previous stage. This is a single stage of a multi-stage inline compressor. So you have the, the gas comes from, from one stage to the next, goes through the impeller, and then goes on to the next stage. Um, the, so the, the components, the, the performance components of these machines are after it comes out of the first the, the one stage and it goes to the crossover, that gas still has some angular velocity to it. So the gas is not only coming this way, but it's also moving radially around the machine. So the, the return channel. If you look at those return channel uh, veins, they look like bananas. And what they're doing is they're catching that radial uh, motion of the gas and straightening it back out so it's going straight into the next stage. Uh, the rotating impeller increases the velocity and the static pressure. So that's what you're doing. You're imparting velocity and static pressure. And the diffuser is a very important part of the pressure, uh, of the pressure creation of the stage. That diffusion uh, reduces the velocity and increases the static pressure. So you're changing kinetic energy into static pressure in, in the diffuser. And what happens is if you don't have an adequate diffuser, you're missing out on recapturing some of the energy that you put in there, and the stage is going to be less efficient. So these are the components of a centrifugal compressor. Um, this particular machine has three nozzles. You got the main process gas nozzle in, and you've got the discharge nozzle out, and you've got a nozzle in the middle, which is a side stream. So this is would be typical of a refrigeration type compressor, where you might have some gas coming in from an economizer or something into that in, in a, an intermediate pressure. But anyway, you've got the case, which holds the whole thing together. Um, you've got the, um, out here on the ends, you've got the uh, seal housings and the, and the bearing housings. So the seal housings go into the end of the casing and they hold the seals and hold the porting for them. The bearing housings do exactly that. They mount onto the end. They support the bearings, which supports, in turn, it supports the rotating element. Um, and then you've got the shaft, which is the main thing with the rotating element. Um, and you've got the journal bearings, thrust bearings, and seals. This particular machine has four stages of compression with the side stream. And that's a little bit uh, an actual a picture of the actual machine there. So you've got the impellers, you've got the diffuser passages, you've got the return bend, which is taking gas from one stage back to the next. You've got diaphragms, which make up part of the, uh, of the diffuser and the return channel. Um, you've got the side stream inlet, and you can see where the gas comes down and mixes right before the stage. You get a good mixing of the gas. <clears throat> and then you've got labyrinth packing. So the labyrinth packings are there to prevent recirculation from the stage because you have from the, uh, the discharge of the impeller back to the eye, you've got the the pressure rise of the impeller. So that gas, if you didn't have a seal there, it's gonna to try to get back to the inlet and just recirculate and be inefficient. Um, from, you have labyrinth packings behind for the, from the inlet of the next stage back to the back of the previous stage because you get the static pressure rise from the diffuser to the inlet. So there's a delta P from the, the back of that impeller to the eye of the next one because you had the additional static pressure rise. So those, those uh, labyrinths were there to keep the gas from going back. <clears throat> and then um, I don't get into to, uh, 
balancing pressure balance machine, but uh, or thrust balance. But each one of these stages, because the it has a higher pressure from the eye, from the inlet to the eye on the back, and it doesn't front. It wants to move the whole rotor in that direction. So what you do in a multi-state machine is you put a balance piston on the back, um, and and that the back side of the balance piston is piped back typically to the inlet of the compressor. So that's inlet pressure back here, final discharge or close to final discharge pressure on the one side. So you get a much bigger force to pull that rotor back and balance out the thrust. Um, just typically a rule of thumb is the balance piston diameter is about the average of the entire eyes. So if you're looking at doing a thrust balance calculation, that's a good diameter to start with. Um, typical rotor assembly, this would be, uh, they're not always built like this, um, but this would be, is what's acceptable to API and kind of written into API is a built up, what we call a built up shaft. So it's got a solid shaft and all of the, all of the rotating components are fixed onto that shaft in some method. Um, Modern design practices are to just shrink the impellers onto the shaft and that fit is what transmits the torque from the shaft to the impeller. And uh, so that's, that's the, uh, the rotating element. Couple, you know, a couple critical things you'll see the journal, the journal surfaces are critical, the, the, the diameter and the finish of them. Uh, the places where your vibration probes look at have to be burnished and have to be very fine. <clears throat> so, you know, when you see a, a shaft come out, those areas will be protected like the one we saw today. After that, we're done with the balance machine. Those, those areas will be wrapped before they go out, go out, or they'll be put back right into the machine. Uh, centrifugal compressor design. So uh, just nothing too detailed here, but what goes into the design of a centrifugal compressor? So my talk, the first part of this talk was about the performance. And that's really what, why the machine exists, right? It's to perform work. So the aerodynamics is where it all starts. But after you get that, you have to start thinking about, okay, we've got a machine that's gonna do this. So you're gonna do stress, I talked about deflection, thermal growth, modal interferences, You've got to have material selections for the stress and the deflection and the thermal growth, but also the process gas and the service location. And then you've got all the rotor dynamics to, to consider the rotor configuration, the bearing designs, uh, you know, excitation forces, the drive system, you know, how, how that system's driving and how's it interact with the rest of the machine. Um, you've got the ceiling. So just think of all the sealing that happens inside one of these machines. You got to seal between the stages, you got to seal at the balance piston, you got to seal the you got to seal at the ends of the machine. So the gas you're compressing and putting that work paper isn't just leaking outside. You've got to do gas oil interfaces, you've got to do oil atmosphere interfaces, you've got to do flange, you know, where you're connecting metal to metal interfaces. So all that's got to work. You got to worry about joint forces, joint sealing, the drive interface and protection systems, um, nozzle sizes, locations, arrangements. How, how's it interacting with the, with the process? How's it interacting with support systems? Um, and then monitoring critical data. Most of these machines are run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for three to 15, 20 years. So you, you need to know what they're doing, what their health is. You vibration, you measure temperature, you measure speed, you look at the performance. And then additionally, you have to worry about being able to make this stuff. Right? You got to manufacture it, you got to assemble it, you gotta figure out what kind of tooling goes in to make it. So API 617 um, addresses many of these issues and more. There's a lot of decisions that have to go to, into it. Uh, but uh, George Donald, who I talked about earlier, said, Every, every one of the paragraphs in API can relate to some person's experience with a machine or something went bad. You had to figure out what it was and why it happened. And, and, and as, as the technology grew, the, 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 uh, the problems became much more subtle. So it takes a lot of engineering to figure out what went wrong and what, what do you need to do to fix it. 
fortunately, uh, there's a, a lot of knowledge today to, uh, to admit that. <clears throat> so uh, performance improvements. Um, so typically the efficiency from a, like a 1970s vintage unit to today's, just straight up, you know, looking at the same exact performance, you're getting at least five to seven points more in efficiency better than you did then. Most of the gains in the efficiency had come outside the impellers. The impeller, the impeller designs, the impellers themselves are relatively efficient places no matter how you build them. It's how what you do with the gas, how you handle it, how you, how you control the velocities through the machine, the surface finishes of, of everything, and just making sure that gas is controlled and handled and not doing anything, sudden expansions and things like that. So just straight efficiencies. Um, and and uh, another the thing that's more common to see is catching up with what we call process creep. So once these machines go in, the operators want to go and just crank it up and make as much product as, as you can out the back end because that's what you get paid for. So typically what you'll see is the machine is no longer operating at a specificity point. It's being pushed out here on its curve. So if you then put in modern technology and you right size the machine to match where the process is now, you can get up to 15 points in efficiency just by doing that. Seen, I've seen installations where you get 10% more capacity out of the machine for less horsepower than we're putting in before. And these are the things that, you know, drive process pre, you know, changes in the, in the gas, you might have a different feedstock than it was originally considered in the unit design, maybe a different catalyst. See that a lot of catalyst changes do a lot. Uh, maybe you have a higher purity gas, you know, it's typical to make, uh, to get rid of sulfur in product to, to use more hydrogen, because that's, mm -hmm. that's what gets rid of it. Uh, maybe, maybe an upstream unit's been re-rated and there's more capacity coming into this unit. Maybe there's a different product slate that you're wanting that, that causes the change. Um, the market for the product particular unit is good, so you wanna make more. Um, changes in the operating permit, we've seen where before the permit said you can run at a capacity, now you're putting on emission monitoring system and you're limited by the emissions that go out and maybe you can make more product and still stay within the emissions limit. Uh, Re-rate of an upstream or downstream unit or maybe more favorable feedstock that makes more of the, the gas that these compressors are handling. And then reliability improvements. Um, this is, uh, you know, reliability, uh, we call these upgrades to machines. So when we're doing a performance change, we'll call it a re-rate. When we're doing a reliability, we call it an upgrade. So there's a lot of technology available to handle the problems that decrease the reliability of these machines that keep them from running for longer periods of time. Uh, things like swirl brakes, uh, which take care of when you get into real high pressure machines, um, the gases as you're going through the labyrinth packings will actually put an aerodynamic cross coupling in the rotor and excite the frequencies. So you may end up with a machine that's unstable. That, you know, it might, instead of, instead of when you put in a, a, a stabilizing force, it doesn't smooth out the operation of the machine. Um, the swirl brakes will actually stop the gas from swirling around and causing aerodynamic instability. Uh, balance piston seals, instead of just straight labyrinths, you can put whole labyrinths or honeycomb. Those are actually help the dampening of the rotor. They increase the dampening and improve the rotor dynamic performance. Uh, there's a lot of things to do with oil seals. You can just upgrade to newer type oil seals that are easier to maintain, lower pressure drops, lower oil leakage, waste oil leakage, or you can go to gas seals. Um, Probably 99% of centrifugal compressors new are put, in, put out gas seals because it's just a more simpler, more reliable, less uh, energy intensive because the, the gas seals don't have any as much parasitic losses as oil seals. Um, a lot you can do with bearings. Um, typically, if a machine has rotor dynamic problems, often a, a bearing design change will, will help. Um, See, you know, things where you just change from a load between pad to a load on pad and maybe increase the LOD 
of the bearings and you get more surface area and less load on the, on the bearings, it helps the machine. Just a, a lot of tools, um, a lot of materials, uh, a lot of different designs, um, you know, copper back shoes to reduce heat. You can go with direct oil injection that injects the oil right up in front of the, of the bearings and, and makes them perform better and cooler. So there's just a lot of, a lot of technology available in bearings. Um, damper bearings. I mean, if, if you have machines that are motor dynamic problems, you can put dynamic uh, damper bearings in that will actually damp out the vibrations of, of the machine. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with labyrinths. There's polymers that are abradable labyrinths that will be more resistant for, for corrosion. You can run tighter tolerances. You can run it too rough or not as, not as bad. Um, another thing that we found with polymer labyrinths, not necessarily uh, uh, the force in the mountains walking out, but the, uh, certainly the Torreon and the, the peak uh, labyrinths is after they get through a run, they roll right out because there's nothing to grow in them, they don't work as well. Uh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of coatings that are available for both uh, corrosion and uh, uh, buildup of, of polymerization or salts that cause uh, inefficiencies. And then there's a lot of things you can do with design, like hydraulic thrust discs are a big improvement we considered that because these machines you want to be able to change out seals without pulling the whole machine apart. So you got to take off the, uh, the, the, the hydraulic the thrust disc on one end. And if, you, and if you mount it hydraulically, you can dismount it without using heat in the middle of a hydrocarbon processing facility. Not, heat's not usually, usually looked on favorable. So you can disassemble and reassemble the machine without that. Couplings and shaft end attachments. Uh, you know, many of these machines out there have lubricated couplings or gear type couplings. Great for misalignment, but eventually those, those uh, teeth wear and they lock up and they cause the thrusting, the, 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 the uh, thrust problems through the machine. So there's several different designs of, of dry couplings that just use flexible elements to allow for misalignment. And then controls. Um, Always, always a big issue, kind of, kind of a separate part in this field because of the controls, but you know, your computer is good for what? Maybe a little bit longer these days, but I remember when every two or three years your computer was obsolete. <laughs> right? So a lot of the control systems that are out there, you can't even buy parts from them. You know, to keep them up to date. And plus, uh, plus the, uh, the technology is old. There's a lot more new technology out there with the controls that can help these machines operate more reliably. Uh, so here's just some project exam examples of, of interesting things that RMS has done, mostly on the engineered equipment side. So this is a, a carrier compressor um, and we did a case replacement. And this machine, it's an old, it was an old cast case. And the main problem and a lot of problems with these machines is they when you get around the seal areas, the, the bolting configuration, bolts get very small and you can't get enough compression on these bolts to keep the gas from leaking around seals and out the, and, uh, and, and actually becomes, in this case, this project was justified for safety reasons because you had a gas, and I think it had H2S in it, that they could never get it to keep them out of the, out of the casing. So they decided to replace it. Uh, we went in and redesigned the casing as an exact drop-in replacement. As a matter of fact, we took the internals from the old machine and put it in the new casing. Uh, but this was a, a new casing with, uh, you can't really see that up there for some reason, but it, it was uh, hydro tested at 225 versus 150 of the old casing. So we were able to get 75 more pounds um, it was made out of A516 grade 70 steel, so weld repairable versus cast iron. And this, we did do an upgrade on this machine on the uh, non the non pressurized bearing. So, because with the design of this uh, machine on the one end that wasn't the drive end, it would just allow the bearings to operate in the process gas. So the, the seal, there was no seal there. The gas was just stopped by 
everything on the, on the nine diagram. Um, the problem is, is if you had certain gas constituents like um, isobutane, you're going to turn your oil into gasoline. Save your oils. So we put so we we put in new seals in this machine. We sealed up that that non dive end so that the uh, the gas would not get into the oil. And there's just some pictures of the fabrication being done. Oops, sorry, jump. Uh, and this is this is the finished machine. And there you can see the, these internals are actually the old internals that were in, in the other machines that were casing. Another, another casing replacement project that these, these just happen to be the more interesting ones. This one, this one, it, the, the gas is, is very corrosive, very hard. It's a relatively high pressure. Um, and this was a horizontal split machine. The last time before we replaced this casing, when they put it together, they actually welded the split line shut. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. So to keep it from to keep it from leaking. <laughs> so yeah. We did a study and we said, okay, we can design a new casing. You can use the, the existing rotor and, and a lot of the stationary parts, the seals and the bearings. And and after after the customer looked at the project and was looking at spending this money, they decided to really to replace everything. We actually put brand new seals, brand new bearings, brand new dot, brand new rotor and impeller, and they're all stainless because they're very corrosive. The, and, the, and the casing itself is stainless. So, what kind of stainless? The, the casing? Yeah, um, 16 or I think something. Something like something in that form is like a three, a three hundred series thing. Huh? Three hundred series? I think it's a three hundred series thing. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> and there's so there's some pictures of the uh, casing. So this this we do a lot for old old type barrel machines. We'll, we'll build a design an extraction kit. So what this does is it's a hydraulic tool that helps you install the bundle and pull it out. So, and it gives you a plate, you know, place for the, the bundle to ride on as it comes out. So it makes, makes maintenance a lot simpler. Yeah, it must have because the, uh, the other machine had top section of discharge. So yeah, take this one does off. too. Yeah, that's right. It, it, so in order to get the, to do the maintenance, you have to pull off pipes. Pull pipes. Yeah, this, this is easier. Yeah, this is easier. Uh, this is a, um, it's a, it's actually an air compressor in nitric acid service. So it's a nitric acid plant. I don't know how to check. Yeah. So we did, uh, we redesigned. Uh, some of the some of the stationary parts, all of the, the all of the impellers were new. Um, we did put a vein diffuser in the last stage to help the efficiency. Now, vein diffusers are very good at helping efficiency, but what they do is they reduce the range of the stage, so you get a higher peak efficiency, but you get less range from surge to choke. What's the material used for the casing? I'm sorry. What's the material used for the casing for the nitric acid compressor? It's it's you know, those are typically cast iron and cast steel. Yeah, it's, it's an air compressor. <clears throat> it's kind of it says nitric acid compressor, but it's actually an air compressor used in a nitric acid plant. Yeah. Did you jump past this one? Is it fabricated? Hmm? Are these fabricated pencils or are these? No, that's cast that's a cast casing. Yeah, that's a cast casing. This was actually. That was actually a casing that was available on the surface market. Oh, okay. Um, so we did a 10% increase in efficiency, a 14%, 14% increase in flow, new high efficiency impellers, new diaphragms, bearing upgrade, fleet unit built up using the surplus. Weren't you getting cast at? It was surplus. It was already cast. Oh, okay. It was already cast and built. The and somebody that put it in. The other one was cast too, wasn't it? No, that was that was a fabricated case. Okay? Yeah, all the other previous casing were fabricated. This casing, yeah, we did this is not our design. This is this is an Ingersoll range. The CDM the model. 
And I think this is my last slide. Um, so this was a pipeline compressor and the, the customer had, I think maybe like half a dozen of these machines at different stations, pipeline stations. And some of them worked good and some of them were bad. You know, they were like 10, 10 12% low on efficiency. So he said, you know, we, we want to know why, you know, these machines were not operating. So we did, we did some colorful fluid dynamics. Yeah, computational fluid dynamics on the machines. We, we, we actually, so this is one case where we're measuring and trying to figure out when. So we went in and measured all of the existing components, the, uh, the volume, the inlet pieces, and we made a model of the compressor and, and did it. And what we found is that the volute was oversized for the machines. The volute was too big. So the gas, the gas was coming off the impeller at the fuser and then dumping into a big void that was too big for the amount of volume that was going through. So that's where they were losing all the efficiency. So we, we designed a new volute for them, put it in service, and we've since done four of these machines for this customer. So, and you can see, uh, so uh, this one shows the performance. So it looks like we got a little upset. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the details of the performance on this one, but that's, that was basically okay. So those are the kinds of things we do. Unrelated question, where is that plant? Yeah. <laughs> that plant? I believe that is in Anacortes, Washington. Okay, I remember when I was in that close, but, uh, yeah. yeah, you can get a picture like that if you put, you know, the whale watching boats. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't get out of the to bring the time in the efficiency. I'm sorry? The efficiency increase. Are you able to bring the time in that? The, the increase of what? Efficiency the increase. Are you able to bring the time in that before you? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's where, where we start with getting new studies. Can you repeat what you just heard? Yeah, I'm not sure. I still didn't catch the. So I'm, I'm trying to say the efficiency increase you make to either your refurbishing. Yes. You were able to clean time in that. If so, yes. how do you do that? Uh, we do that by experience, right? So we know. We have a lot of experience in building and designing stages and testing stages and putting stages in, out in the field and, and seeing how they perform there. So there, it, there's a lot of science that goes into it, but I, I do a lot of that. So look at the quantity constant of the stage. So that determines how big the stage is. Is it this, you know, is it the impeller the big with the 3D blades? The real high quantity concept was the impeller, a little skinny one with you know two D blades that go through it. That's one of the, the terms that that tells you where it goes on the efficiency curve. Actually, something right in the middle of the of the range of centrifugal pressures most efficient. You can get up with 85, 86, 87 percent efficiency on the stages. We actually have tested some at 90. In the middle, when you get up to the high end of the of the stage range. Then you then you drop off. But there's there's a lot of other things going through too. Also, like the fuser, I was talking about the fuser. The fuse, the fuser start getting down to less than like one point five. The fuser ratio. So the ratio at the end of the diameter at the end of the fuser divided by the diameter of the impeller. That's the fuser ratio. If it gets much below one point five, you got to start knocking down the efficiency because you're not going to be recovering the potential. Um, then um, and then mock numbers, right? How how fast is the tip running relative? To, I mean, I've seen propylene machines where you're, where you're running over one mock. You're running over slime at the tip. Theoretically, that doesn't really matter. It matters at the end. You know, if you break a mock number at the end, that's that's what it can be a problem. But they have been designed very close to one mock at the end. Successful. Um, but but there's an effect on mock numbers that'll knock down efficiency too. Um, there's all that I need to go into. Like, like controlling the flow. 
there was one really big compressor, that air compressor, that the customer always had problems with the efficiency of this one stage. So we, we looked at it and we said, well, it was pretty obvious to us that it, it was coming out of the impeller and it was dumping into the, the diffuser. It was just the design of the, of the, of the machine that caused it to do that. But all you had to do was put some plates in there and control that flow until it got going to the next stage and we're able to improve it. So it's just a lot of aerodynamic things going into the experience. What is the biggest challenges on, on, on hydrogen applications? Since the molecular weight is so light, right? Yeah. Right? As, uh, so it's getting, well. it's getting, making head. It's getting as much <laughs> head into that machine as you can. Um, because, so, because, because you definitely want, want to make as much pressure as you want to, you want to make. So the things you, you run up against is limitations on tip speed, because the faster you can go the tip is the more edge you can get. But materials can only stand so much. So with a, with a, a regular high, high uh, alloy steel, you might be able to go 1,000 feet per second. Uh, 17 force stainless, uh, you might be able to go 1,100. Titanium, maybe 1,400 feet per second. But now you're getting the costs are really going up. Yeah. 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 Having these ratios and flows with the hydrogen, I'm assuming you, you guys also face some kind of problem with uh, our, we designed usually chaps like this to be almost um, a rigid chap because of multi stage. Yeah. And do we have, do we have any problem with bending modes on, on this kind of application? Most, most of these, most of the, most of the multi stage machines that are running at high speed. Are, are, are flexible shaft machines. Um, there's been, there has been a trend to go to bigger shafts, like if you look at the data line up or new stuff from GE, there's barrel machines that are high pressure machines with bigger shafts mm -hmm. because they, they want to, <clears throat> they don't want to be as flexible. And they, and they also want to be able to put a lot more stages. And, you know, so a smaller package is going to head so the shafts up to the bigger. But most most multi stage machines are flexible shaft machines, and they run usually between the first and second period. Right. So that's why you know you bring bring a machine up fast. It has to go through first critical speed, which is the first bending mode, mm -hmm. it has the most energy and it's the most destructive, and then it settles in between the first and second critical speed. So, from your personal experience, what have you seen be the reoccurring issue that these uh, that these clients are bringing to you, consuming their own pumps, and you have to be repaired? I know there's a lot of factors, especially with like the fluid that would be going in and what type of pump. I wanted to point out, so we saw that the, the machine with the rotor that we had in the balance. I don't know if you noticed, but this has really good results. So, so they've been, those wheels have been operating for like 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> riveted wheels. We, we, actually, we actually, actually still repair, we repair riveted impellers in our bedroom. So right. Right. we can replace rivets. We don't make any new ones, but we can, we have, we, we just did a 57 inch diameter impeller and we have a now. Last one was for But I would say the majority of the problems are these days are more around corrosion, uh, erosion, and um, things like uh, buildup of salts and polymerization and things like that. So a lot of coatings, a lot of specialty materials, uh, those, those are the, the issues. Uh, but there's still a lot of machines that have some really basic problems. Customers, a lot of times just look at them. We're looking at one machine now that the customer the gas is much lighter. And for the past probably four or five years, they've been injecting propane. Well, it's, that's pretty expensive to do that. Right? <laughs> so, so they're looking to get away, away from doing that. To redesign the machine. It's usually repurposing. So we're seeing a lot of that. Good purpose.
Well, lead time is going out now. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think the lead times have stabilized a little bit. For a while, they were like where we were getting forgings, like you know, high, high, uh, good, you know, good steel forgings uh, were. Four to six weeks, they were going six to eight or eight to ten weeks before these. That was one of the different things. Uh, what we're seeing right now is rapid increases in anything with nickel. Uh, I think, I think the, the uh, stainless steels have gone up like 20% in the past two weeks. Yeah, the past two weeks, 20% for stainless. So you can get on these, have to pull off. But I think that's very because a lot of I think a lot of nickel comes is coming out of that. Are there any questions in the chat? Can you turn the lights. No. Good idea. I was getting used to that. Wait, no, my prayer. This was a sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 And it is me some drive and the tape measure the level. It's also amazing. Thank you for doing this for us. I appreciate okay. it. And anyone who needs a PDA certificate, I have them at the back and I also have a PDF version for the people online. Uh, people online, please email that ASME secretary text and send them to you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and be sure um, it's March 21st. It's gas turbine at UHCL Solar Turbines is going to present. Keep an eye on the event break uh, page and what pops up there. Can you get the snack? One point is invented.